Good evening, everybody. Waiting for those of you that are going to join me tonight to pop on. And um, we will get cranking in just a couple minutes. Okay, guys? Well, praise the Lord. Uh, it is Tuesday night, and uh, we are in Passion Week, which is a blessing. Um, beginning of April, April 4th, and we know that this Sunday we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to welcome you to be a part of that at our 10 a.m. service at Calvary, but also Friday night, this Friday night um, at 7 we will be in the main sanctuary, um, and we will have a Good Friday service. We'll do several things, have communion together, and then afterwards we'll have uh, uh, desserts and coffee. Hey, Bernice, God bless you. So good to check in with you. Um, we're just waiting a couple minutes for others to pop on here, and then we're going to get cranking. All right. But uh, we are in Passion Week, which I love. Um, some of the most incredible teachings that Jesus did occurred at the final week of his life and and a lot of it had to do with what happened in the upper room and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight about the upper room discourse um, and then we'll go from there and see what God is doing and uh, it should it should lead us into some good conversation all right guys uh, just uh, another minute and uh, we'll uh, open in prayer and then we'll jump right in. Praise God. Woo! Well, a lot's going on in the world around us. We know that uh, in that last week of, of the life of Christ, um, he did some teaching um, uh, on signs of the end times as well. And if you want to review that, you can read Matthew chapter 24. Um, and there's a lot in there. Um, and it will kind of... Uh, lead us into seeing uh, um, some of the signs that are, are already upon us um, as we are seeing the, uh, uh, the clock of, of world history kind of wind down um, and Jesus making ready his return. But we are here to celebrate tonight. We're going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. We are going to celebrate uh, the fact that Jesus Christ did the greatest act of love that anyone has ever, ever done uh, in the history of humanity. And uh, he did it in human form. He came into our darkness and brought his light and uh, made a way to shine that light into our hearts. So we thank God for, for uh, redemption, for forgiveness of sin, for paying the price for our sin on, on the, uh, the cross of Calvary and for shedding his blood, which was an acceptable sacrifice by God the Father. Uh, let me open the word of prayer, and then we are going to dive right in. Well, Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight that we can be with you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would cause our hearts, God, to, uh, to absorb the life-giving properties of the word of God. We ask that our lives would be uh, infused with power, God. Power to, to live as those who have evidence that you are everything you said you are, God. Cause our lives to be a city on a hill, God, a, a light on a lampstand, uh, that the world might look at us and not see us, but see Jesus and the miraculous, miracle-working power that uh, that is is housed inside of us, because our lives are 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 gleaming, illuminating, with the beauty of God. Father, help us to be a witness in these last days. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Well, let's kick in, guys. Um, uh, the title for tonight is a new commandment. Um, again, I, I started out by saying. Some of the greatest teachings that Jesus ever did was in that final week. Um, a lot of parables came out in that. Um, if you read through uh, uh, the ending chapters of Matthew after the triumphal entry and uh, before the Last Supper or the Passover um, that Jesus uh, celebrated with his disciples in the upper room, if you read everything that transpired 
that final week, uh, you will begin to experience uh, um, some of the greatest, most dynamic teachings. And really, uh, when you look at the upper room um, where Jesus spoke after the Passover, now before they went out to Gethsemane to pray, Jesus said, it's time, uh, we must leave now. John records uh, entire segments of dynamic uh, teaching and, and, and things that Jesus did by example to the disciples. So we're going to start there. Again, the title is A New Commandment, and we're dealing with uh, what Jesus taught the disciples um, at the Last Supper before they went to Gethsemane uh, to pray. Jesus asked them to pray with him, and then uh, we know that story, how they, they fell asleep and, and could not stay awake, and um, and Jesus was praying, you know, um, uh, to such a degree because he was about to uh, uh, become the sacrifice for sin for the for the sin of all humanity and the weight of sin was coming upon him he was going to carry that to the cross an innocent man carrying our guilt um, carrying our condemnation and so Jesus was preparing himself for that uh, in Gethsemane and then we know that that is where he was arrested where Judas had taken him now if we start out in John chapter 13, if you go to the beginning of the chapter, he's talking about the Passover um, and uh, preparing the Passover and things like that. Hey, Tony, glad you're checking in with us. Um, but I'm jumping down, all the way down to the bottom of the chapter in verse uh, 31. Okay, I'm going to read um, verses uh, 31 through 38, and then we're going we're gonna to jump into chapter 14. Uh, but let me jump in here at verse 31, and it starts out by saying this. So, <coughs> excuse me. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, uh, and who was he talking about now when he says, so he had gone out? If you read the text above that, he's talking about Judas. Um, John, uh, the beloved, had put his head on the chest of Jesus and said, because Jesus was talking about that this very night one of you will betray me. So John says and whispers to Jesus, well, who is it, Lord? And Jesus says, the one um, who takes the bread that I dip, um, he is the one. And uh, we know that if you read the text, he says he dipped uh, his bread. Um, and that is uh, in, 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 in the bitter herbs uh, and parsley and, and uh, um, bread in the water. And, and it's part of the Passover meal. And uh, he gives it to Judas. Um, and um, then he says to Judas, what, what you're about to do, do quickly. And Judas leaves. And so that's where we pick it up in the story here. They finished the, the dining part of Passover. But now Jesus is getting into uh, some of the teaching aspect of it. And so at the close of chapter 13, uh, chapter 14, chapter 15 and 16 is, is the most incredible teachings that Jesus has ever given his disciples. Um, and this was important to Jesus. Um, and, and it was important that he he make sure that at the testimony of the resurrection, all these things uh, will be useful for the disciples. They didn't grab onto the concepts when they were first taught, but these things are going to become useful. Marge is on with us, and so is Claudette. God bless you guys. Um, so here we are in verse 31 of chapter 13 uh, now if, if if again it's chapters 13 14 15 and 16 the upper room discourse chapter 17 gets into the Gethsemane prayer of Jesus okay the most powerful prayer of Jesus is in John chapter 17 now in Matthew 6 um, um, Jesus gives the model prayer um, you might have heard that talked about as the Lord's Prayer it's not the Lord's Prayer, it's the model prayer that Jesus gave his disciples when they asked him to teach us how to pray. Uh, that's in Matthew 6, and, and, and people have called that the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven. We know that prayer. Um, but really the Lord's Prayer is recorded in Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus is praying, Father, make them one as we are one, so the world might know that you sent me. And there's a lot more in that prayer, and it's, it'd be a great prayer to read and to meditate on. Um, because as we, we, we break that down, Jesus is starting by laying the foundation here in chapter 13 about becoming one, becoming unified. And so 
he says this to his disciples. Judas now leaves, and he says in verse 31, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God the Father is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself. He's talking about the unity of, of Father and Son and, and, and the Holy Spirit as well. And he goes on to say, and glorify him immediately. Now, let me just break this down for you. Um, how is God glorified? God is glorified through our obedience. <laughs> Jesus is going to complete the mission for which he came. And he's going to do it uh, in, in such an incredible way. To go all the way to crucifixion as an innocent man. And his extreme radical obedience. And that's the only way I can describe it. Uh, Jesus performed radical obedience. Um, you know, Hebrews 12 tells us that um, Jesus um, endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. And then it goes on to say in Hebrews 12 that, um, um, you know, who of us uh, have faced bloodshed to, to, to live our faith? I'm just paraphrasing now. He's saying, so, you know, Jesus is able to take you all the way through um, and to empower you uh, to, to obey God your whole life. Um, it's been said that people will never remember um, how you come into a relationship, but they sure will remember how you leave. And so... I don't want to leave the relationship with Jesus. I don't want you to leave your relationship with Jesus. I want you to finish strong. Endure. Right? Finish the race that is set before you. And it is so encouraging what Jesus is saying here. So his extreme obedience glorifies God. Your obedience glorifies God. How else could we possibly do what God asks us to do without God empowering us and without God getting all the glory. I mean, what we do is not natural. It's, it defies natural wisdom. Okay, To follow Jesus Christ defies natural wisdom because the world's wisdom is foolishness to God. All right? Okay, here we are. Our obedience glorifies God. Now, verse 33 says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer you will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. So now why, why does he address them as little children? These are grown men. Um, spiritually, they are. Um, he's trying to break this down to them in a way that they can digest it, and in a way that it'll come back later to them uh, after the resurrection. These are important lessons because we're going to get into this. Um, when he talks in chapter 14, 15, and 16 about the Holy Spirit, um, that's right, John. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Um, and that's in uh, Hebrews 12. Thank you for that. Uh, I love how you guys kick in, so keep doing that. Uh, and I want you guys to read the messages as uh, that are on the sidebar as we go through this because the comments are, are really cool um, and reinforce some of the things we're talking about. I, I want this to be as interactive as possible. I know it's kind of hard because um, we're not face-to-face, -face, um, but you can message and others can uh, give the thumbs up for those, for those uh, uh, messages and, um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll all celebrate together what God is doing for all of us as one. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So he addresses them as little children. Hey, Carolyn, God bless you. Always good to see you. Um, he addresses them as little children. We're in John chapter 13, uh, verse 33. Again, because their spiritual maturity level is, is, is like an, an infant child, and he's breaking it down uh, um, um, in a way that they can, again, receive it, digest it. I said that before. Um, but he goes on to tell them this. He goes, I'm going to go somewhere. In other words, you're going to seek me. And as I said to the Jews where I'm going... You cannot come, so now I say to you, all right? Now he's preparing them again. And as we jump into chapter 14 of John, um, 
you're going to see um, that this was important that they understood that he would not leave them orphaned, um, but he would make sure that they were well cared for and that they would still have a mentor um, in the Godhead, which would be the Holy Spirit. Um, but verse 34 is key here. He says, a new commandment I give to you. Now, <laughs> these are individuals who have the entire Old Testament, the Torah, right? Uh, the five, first five books uh, of the Torah, and, and they have the prophets, um, and they have the kings, and they have judges, and they have, uh, you know, all of these, these documented uh, texts of the Old Testament. Um, uh, so much in Isaiah that, that, that uh, was filled with prophecy of Jesus. Um, but he says to them, this is a new commandment. Now think about that. These are individuals whose whole lives were predicated on the law. The law of Moses. And now Jesus says to them, but this commandment is brand new. And the reason he can say that to them is because he raises the bar with an exemplary life that they were a part of so they can see what it means to be obedient to God the Father, what it looks like in natural flesh. In, G in the humanity of Jesus, he was able to exemplify for his disciples what a true believer looks like, acts like, talks like, and lives every day. Every day. All right? Guys, follow some of John's messages because he's really cool with the word. All right. <clears throat> um, so here we are. Um, what is the new commandment then? Uh, remember, these are guys well schooled in the Torah. Well, some of them are not. Some of the fishermen aren't, but um, but they 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 live their lives by commandments <clears throat> religiously. Um, and here's the new commandment: that you love one another. Jesus speaking, and he says that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. Now, Jesus is telling them. Now, if you understand this, Jesus had already washed their feet. Um, at, the, at the Passover time when they were supposed to do the first hand washing, the first hand cleansing, um, in, in the beginning of the Passover meal, Jesus takes off his outer garment, puts a... a, a a towel around him uh, and washes every single one of his disciples feet amazing um, his entire life was exemplary as one who uh, who loved he loved well um, he loved the father to obedience um, uh, hey Carol Ann good to see you with us um, so this new commandment he gives them is not measured by the law it's not measured by any other human that had ever lived before, and it's going to find its its pinnacle um, at the cross of Calvary that he was willing to die for them, an innocent man carrying their sin to the cross of Calvary. And so he tells them, this is the commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Then he goes on to say in verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. All right? Our love for each other is the primary trait of a true follower of Jesus. I mean, think about that. I mean, we, <laughs> we have equated gifts and anointings as spirituality. When Jesus breaks it down a little more simply and says, your greatest spirituality is how you love others. Now, I can give you an entire teaching on that um, based on three chapters in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Now, these three chapters embrace the power gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, it starts out in, in, in verse 12 by listing uh, 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 the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, you've got to have a backdrop with that from... Um, 
uh, Galatians chapter 5 because for every gift there is a fruit. There are nine fruits of the Holy Spirit to complement the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the middle chapter in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, the middle chapter gives the character trait or the motivation for being used of God. It's to love well. It's to love well. He goes on to start in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13. He goes, um, again, when you, when you begin to read that, he, he, he says there, there is a greater... <laughs> Let me just read a little bit of this to you because this will give us the backdrop of what we're talking about. All right, I don't want to mess this up. I'm going to go to it now. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. 1 Corinthians 13. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And I want to tell you something. It's so weird that in what we equate as spirituality today is nothing but a lot of noise making. Um, <laughs> we've got to get down, you know, down to the grassroots level with 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 boots on the ground for those who love well love god well and the first place to start jesus says here's the new commandment that you love each other now these are the same 12 guys that have been tearing at each other trying to find the pecking order who's who's going to sit at the right hand of god who's going to sit at the left hand of god who's going to be this who's going to be that um, and they were all wrestling those things out. But yet when the Holy Spirit came, they were all in one accord in Acts chapter 2. Well, how did they get there? How did they get into one accord, guys? They prayed for 10 days in an upper room. One of the things that, to work out your differences is prayer. And one of the things to work out your differences in the corporate setting with the church is to be involved in a corporate prayer meeting. Okay, not to impress people um, with uh, with your, you know, your pontification, but to bow before God with a heart that's ready to say, God, search me, try me, know my heart today, see if there be any wicked way in me. So we've got these noisemakers. Um, he goes on to say in verse two. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Now, you know the rest of it. Um, I don't need to go to that, so we'll go back to the text that we're talking about. I don't want to be a noisemaker. Um, I don't want to promote the ways God uses me um, because it's it's only by his grace anyway but I want to be known that I care that I love you that I love people um, and I want to love well I want to grow in this area if he starts out by calling them little children and gives them this new commandment he's basically saying I want you to mature in this area this area is the utmost importance that you grow into this area and you learn how to love well because by this all will know that you're my disciple all right all um and uh and that's kind of how we close out chapter 13 now um before the close of of the chapter uh, peter has a conversation with jesus how many know uh, you know what a sidebar is do you ever <laughs> I, I, I remember going to jury duty several times and um, I would ask for a sidebar um, when I was put in the jury box um, to be interviewed, uh, to possibly be put, uh, uh, you know, taken out of the jury pool and put in the jury box to be questioned to see if I was going to be chosen as one of the final jurists. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why um, I couldn't uh, perform that without prejudice uh, according to um, um, the laws of, 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 of the land. Um, um, I base everything on the word of God and I would, I would share that. I would say, well, um, 
you might see this as a bias, but this is this is my the lens I view things. Um, so I would call for a sidebar, talk to the judge and the attorneys, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, and I would explain uh, my position. Um, and uh, and and uh, most times I would be excused. Um, so far, I haven't been put on the jury. So every time, as of yet, I've I've uh, I've been excused. Now the reason I do that up front is to let them know that this is going to be the way I judge things, um, the way I interpret things, the way I see things. Um, and if they do put me on a jury, I want the jury to know that as well. Um, that uh, I believe in the Word of God and live my life that way. Um, so that's important, right? So our maturity level, according to the Word of God, is not based on anointings. Um, see, they're gifts. God does never, he, he never repents of the gifts he gives men uh, and women. Um, but our maturity level is not measured by the gifts God gives us. It's measured by the disciplines in which we follow God. Do we love like God? Jesus says the new commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. That's what Jesus said. That's the measure. That's the standard. All right. Peter now speaks up. We know Peter is always asking for these sidebars, right? So he asks for a sidebar with Jesus. In verse 36 in John 13, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Remember, Jesus said, where I go, you can't come. Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Okay? He let him know that there will be a day when you will give your life uh, the way I give mine, and then you will be with me uh, in in glory uh, for eternity. Uh, but Peter responds, um, uh, Peter, um, I don't know again what it was in Peter, um, but he wanted to make sure um, that that Jesus had all the information before he could uh, make a judgment. So Peter wanted to help him out. So he says in verse 37, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Now we know this famous, this is a famous uh, story in the Gospels, right? Jesus says to him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Now, if you go to Matthew 26, I'm not going to go there. I'm just giving you the reference. Okay, guys, here's the reference. Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75. The three denials of Christ are right there. Now, they're in other Gospels as well, but I think that's the, the, the prominent one. The phrase that he uses all three times is, I do not know the man. All right. Now, remember, Jesus referred to them as little children. The maturity level um, <laughs> was based on the fact that if they were going to follow God, they were going to have to raise their game to a new level, and it's something they couldn't do naturally. They would have to do it by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to get into that in chapter 14. Uh, all right, guys. So here we are. Peter says, I do not know the man. Now, I don't believe... Peter was lying. I, I've got kind of a, a little twist on this. I think Peter was disappointed because he was riding the coattails of Jesus to a place of prominence. He was a lowly fisherman who never had notoriety, probably struggling to make ends meet. Um, and now he is with um, uh, one of the most... Um, um, renowned uh, um, um, rabbis of his time. Um, and he believes, possibly, that he's going to rise with Christ um, in this prominence, in this notoriety. Um, I also believe that Peter, like the, the rest of the Jews that was depicted in the triumphal entry, wanted Jesus to overthrow the Romans they wanted a military general, not a redeemer and a savior and a Lord. And because Jesus didn't meet their expectations, they rejected him. 
So Peter makes a proclamation. When they say, aren't you one of his followers? Now, he says, no, I'm not. Um, isn't that amazing? At that point, he had lost all faith. He had loved Jesus as a person, but had lost his faith in believing that he was the Son of God. The same one who proclaimed, you are the Son of God. Right? Now, that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, but he comes all the way back around after the resurrection. At the end of the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus now is resurrected. He is uh, 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 with the disciples and seen for 40 days before the ascension. Um, and he reinstates Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me? He goes back full circle. Remember the text here we're talking about. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is one of the, of, of, of the group at that point. So Peter's saying, I love you, Jesus. Um, but he denied him. So now he gets reinstated at the end of John, where Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Um, and, and you know the story. So you can read that in the last chapter of the book of John, the Gospel of John, where uh, Peter is reinstated. Um, but he's empowered to do what he couldn't do naturally by the Holy Spirit, which comes uh, uh, upon him in Acts chapter 2. Um, all right, let's jump in now to chapter 14. I just want to get a little further with you before we close out tonight. Um, I'm trying to really um, refine uh, these nights together with you into a 40-minute segment. So I'm trying to be more disciplined in that. Um, chapter 14 in the Gospel of John, beginning at verse 1, Jesus now is letting them know because he had shared with them all of these things. He said he's leaving. They can't go with him. They're beginning to question him. They're beginning to get nervous. Anxiety levels are beginning to rise. So Jesus says this to them in verse 1 of chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Now, you begin to understand this. I've taught on this before. This is a wedding paradigm from a Jewish perspective. The wedding paradigm is this. Um, remember, we went through, um, uh, they went through the Passover already. And when Jesus said, take this cup uh, and drink, this cup is uh, is my blood, the, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Um and that is part of the bridal paradigm as well. It's the cup, the third cup of the Passover, the cup of redemption. Um, and so uh, by them drinking it, they are accepting uh, the proposal of Jesus um, as the bridegroom and they represent the bride, um, which we know in uh, New Testament text, um, it talks about the fact that uh, uh, he is 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 the bridegroom um and we are the bride the church um so when they drink the cup they accept the proposal and here jesus goes to the next step now from jewish um, understanding um after the drinking of the cup the uh the bridegroom uh, departs he leaves instructions for the preparation of the bride um, with the parents um, and they make sure that she fulfills that um, he goes to be uh, to be um, um, uh, subject to his father. In other words, he's, he has to build a home before he can receive his bride. They're, they're under marriage contract at this point. Uh, hey, Regina, so great to see you. Um, so they're under a marriage contract that's binding. They're legally married in Jewish law uh, and biblical law as well. Um, but they cannot consummate the marriage until this this bridegroom has built his bride a home to take her to remember in in the 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 original covenantal agreement uh, of marriage from adam and eve um uh this is now bone of my bone flesh of my flesh for this for this cause or this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one flesh 
So how does he do that? He's got to do that by building a new home, a new place uh, for a new family unit. And he cannot take the bride into, into his heart, uh, into, in, in, into um, his, his life and consummate the marriage until he actually has a place for her. Hey, Karen, God bless you. Um, so he does that. Um, and he's not the one who says when it's ready, the father of the bridegroom is the one who says the home is ready, go get your bride. Remember Jesus said when they said, well, uh, when will these things happen? Uh, when, uh, when, when will you come again? When, you know, when, when will we all be together in eternity? And all these kinds of questions. And, and, and Jesus said, no one knows the, the hour or the day except the Father. Right? So Jesus says here in the marriage paradigm in John 14, um, let not your heart be troubled. In verse 1, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus cannot take you home until your place is completed. All right? All right. That's the marriage paradigm. Um, he goes on to say this uh, in verse 4. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas speaks up, right? We know about Thomas. He speaks up and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going and now we can know the way. Thank God for Thomas because he asked the question that everybody was thinking. And I kind of love Thomas for that. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I'm going to jump down here. Um, let me go down. Uh, I want to go down to verse uh, 15 in John 14 because I want to I want to get to uh, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus again. Now remember, Jesus talked about um, the new commandment in chapter 13. Here he says in verse 15 of John 14, "If you love me, keep my." commandments he didn't say the law he didn't say the law of Moses now we recognize that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law but to, but that through him the law might be fulfilled and so we we understand the study of both uh, Old and New Testament are very important um, we do not uh, you know trash can the old um, but we recognize that this new commandment um, has a love requirement to it that's greater uh, than the old. Um, and so he says this, if you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, what's your motivation for obedience to the commandments of Christ? Is it for approval? Is it for acceptance? Is it, you know, it, to me, it's, it's, it's this big exclamation mark of gratitude. Why do I obey Jesus? Because I am, I've been delivered from damnation. I was sending myself to hell. And I was on the fast track. Then Jesus came into my life and redeemed me and saved me and put me on the right road. And so now my whole life is an exclamation mark of gratitude. If you love me, keep my commandments. The motivation for following, being, being a, a better follower of Jesus Christ is because I love him. And why do I love him? Because he first loved me. We're in Passion Week, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm teaching this text is because these are the most important teachings that Jesus gave his disciples before he was arrested in Gethsemane, falsely tried, crucified, buried, and resurrected the third day. Okay? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Remember, Jesus is leaving. He says, but there's another helper on the way. Uh, praise God. Um, I love that, John, what you, what you just wrote. Guys, read, read uh, John's comment there uh, because when we talk about... Um, uh, the, the old covenant symbolism versus the new covenant symbolism. 
Um, it's so true. The Old Covenant symbolizes um, external uh, um, cleansing um, and renewal, and uh, the New Testament is an internal application because Jesus takes up residence in us through the Holy Spirit. Um, boy, there's so much you can talk about on that one, that one alone. Um, so Jesus is going to give us another helper, one who will abide with us forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so now we are coming into contact with the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Jesus the Beloved Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And now we are embracing all three. Remember Jesus said um, uh, in, in, in verse 6 of this chapter, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus the Son now says no one comes to the Father except through him. And now he's talking about uh, the Holy Spirit sending him. Jesus goes to the Father. The Holy Spirit's the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit can't come until Jesus goes and returns to the Father. Now they both send the Holy Spirit. It's pretty cool stuff, all right? We, we live um, in, in, in embracing uh, the triune uh, uh, character of, of God Almighty. In God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, in verse 18, Jesus, the promise of Jesus, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you're in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now again, Jesus reiterates um, this sense of living um, a kingdom lifestyle. A kingdom lifestyle means that we as subjects of the kingdom of God are going to live by the rule of the king. All right? Grab onto this, guys. We live by the rule of the king. Who is the king? Jesus is the king, right? God gave him all authority over heaven and earth. And so now we live by the rule of the king. And why do we live by the rule of the king? Not because he strong arms us or is manipulating us or is forcing us. We still have free will. What causes us to live in obedience to the rule of the king in the kingdom of God is because we love him. And because we love him, we can love each other. All right, so guys, I, I want to close here because, I mean, this is really important that we get this. Thank you, Claudette, for uh, Acts 4, uh, 412. Praise God. God is so good. Um, one of the greatest things that we, we pick up in this celebratory week of working towards the finished work of the cross and the glorious resurrection is the new commandment of love. I don't serve God uh, because I'm being manipulated. I'm not a puppet. Um, I am a free will servant of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Um, we serve the rule of the King out of love and gratitude because the King pardoned me when I was condemned. He pardoned you also. I'm praying that this will be the week that God will pardon the lost, that God will touch someone you know, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, someone you've been praying about, someone you've been praying for. This would be a great week to touch someone and just share your heart with them. And, uh, you know, you don't have to get preachy, but just let them know, um, you know, that there is a plan for their life. And God would love to share it with them. This is the week that we celebrate 
the finished work of the cross and the glorious resurrection of Jesus, our redemption has been completely solidified by the obedience of God the Son. Remember, it was his obedience that glorified the Father. It is your obedience to the commandment of God that glorifies Jesus. And we do it out of a motivation of love. Let's pray for souls, guys. Let's pray for the lost. Let's believe this week that somebody close to us is getting saved. Somebody close to us is giving their heart to Jesus. Somebody close to us tonight is going to have a dream and a vision. Let's speak that into, into existence right now that, God, you will begin to move as we pray and intercede for our lost loved ones, people we know, God, and even strangers we pass by on the street. We pray that tonight, God, that you will stir up lost souls with dreams and visions. God, that you will cause them to have the veil of world culture lifted off of them and let the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit move and bring into their life a revelation that frees them from the lies that they've been under, the power of the devil. Father, set them free by the love of Christ. And we ask that you use us in that measure. And God, I pray for everyone that's uh, on board tonight, everyone that will see this tomorrow. God, I pray for for their loved ones as well, God, that we're going to see an ingathering. We're gonna we're gonna sit in fellowship with people who one day were lost, but now they're coming to Christ in droves. This is gonna be the greatest ingathering the church has ever known. And we're believing for it for the glory of God in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Have a great night. I love you. And I want to see you all on Resurrection Sunday at Calvary uh, at 10 a.m. And Rosa, God bless. I'm so glad you checked in. Uh, guys, I'm checking out tonight. And uh, let's begin to believe for dreams and visions. God saving the loss. Amen.